From religion to wrestling, gumbo to grits, politics to poetry, and all things Southern in between, this is Take on the South. Produced by the Institute for Southern Studies and hosted by the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Carolina, Take on the South examines the highs and lows of the American South, examines the truths and fictions of the country's most distinctive region, and picks the brains of some of its most accomplished students. To understand the South, you need to take it on, and that's what we'll be doing. Join us as we take on the South. Welcome to Take On the South, the podcast Institute for Southern Studies at the University of South Carolina. I'm Matt Simmons, the Assistant Director of the Institute, and I'll be your host today. This summer, I was in my hometown back in Columbus County, North Carolina, and I'm sitting there on my daddy's couch, and I pick up a magazine published by our local newspaper, the News Reporter, 954 Magazine, 954 now every square mile of Columbus County. And I was looking through there, I read an interview there with an author named Jason Mott, an author from Bolton, an author who had just recently won the National Book Award for fiction. And I said, how has somebody from Columbus County done one of the National Book Award? I must find out about this. I immediately ordered the book, and as soon as I get back home from Daddy's house and I sit down with the book, I devour it, and I'm really taken with this book. And I look at my boss, Mark Smith, the director here at the Southern Studies, and I say, I don't care what we got to do. We got to get Jason Mott, that award winning author here, to talk to on this show. And here, Jason Mott, here you are with us. Yep, here I am. Fantastic. Well, Jason Mott is the author of Hell of a Book, the 2021 National Book Award winner for fiction. Also, the author of three other novels and two collections of poetry. Yeah, right? that's it. A uh, uh, really uh, significant uh, contributor to the development of Southern literature and letters in our day and time. A sometimes instructor of creative writing at UNCW. Yes, correct. And a proud, as we were just having lunch, a proud at least fourth generation son of mm-hmm. that metropolis, <laughs> Bolton, North Carolina. What exactly. are you up to? About twelve hundred people now? Oh uh, no, good lord, no, maybe like seven hundred. So. Seven hundred, seven hundred. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I'm from Weibel, so I'm from the big city. Exactly. There, you know, so yeah, exactly. Just, uh, you know, all, all four thousand of us there. You know, we're from town. <laughs> but you know, my cousins are always like, "You're from Weibel. You're from the big city." And I remember when I moved to Raleigh in two thousand eight, thinking, if I was from the big city in Weibel, man, that wasn't nothing. Raleigh is the biggest place <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. Uh, here we are, two sons of Columbus County, North Carolina, um, here in the Take on the South studios. Um, all this joking aside, Jason, uh, I want to jump into talking about Hell of a Book and talking about your artistic project more, uh, more generally. But before we do that, I want to ask you a really particular question. What is a mad kid? Hmm, good question. Um, so for me, a mad kid is someone who was very much like myself, where I grew up being very angry because I was the bullied kid. Um, and so you get both you know, mad in the sense of being angry, but then you turn into an adult and you find out that the world doesn't function the way you were kind of led to believe it did. And you get frustrated. And sometimes it can drive you mad in the sense of you begin to lose your grip on reality and you just, you, you bury yourself in your imagination and you become a writer or whatever the thing yes. is you do to escape. Um, so that is what a mad kid is, is in essence, I guess. Very good, very good. That makes a lot of sense. And and it, 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 especially having, when you read Hell of a Book, it's the author of Hell of a Book is in some ways himself a mad kid. And this is strange. Those of y'all who haven't read the novel, you might, wait a minute, I, am I, aren't I talking to the author? I am talking to the author. But the novel is about an unnamed writer who writes a book called Hell of a Book that he's on a book tour about. Mm-hmm. As I'm trying to explain this book to some people, they're like, oh, are you talking about Jason Motter, a character? Well, I'm talking about, I guess, a mad kid here, right? Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. so, so either way. But all of this kind of then leads to this th- th- this moment here, um, about two-thirds of the way through the novel, where we get this description of Bolton, which is, and I wonder about this, is Bolton, is the Bolton here the real place or a fictional version thereof? And, and there's something about the geography and the topography of, of, of Columbus County here that throws me a little bit in the novel. So is this a fictional version of Bolton or a is there a decent amount of, truth and reality of this. No, there's a mixture, Bolton. there's a mixture of truth and reality. And I tend to, you know, there, the lines are blurred for very specific reasons. Sure. Um, so oftentimes during this interview, I'm going to duck questions about which ones is real. Yeah, which one yeah isn't. No, I love it. I love it. Um, but yeah, it is very much based off of the town, the real world town of Boston, North Carolina. Um, so there's a lot of truth. There's also, I mean, a lot of fact, but there's also a lot of fiction yeah. kind of sprinkled on top as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about early in the uh, in the novel where Soot and his father go to visit uh, go to visit their granddaddy um, at a, in a nursing home in in, in Wyville, right? And the description is it's a three hour drive, 
And of course, I know where Bolton is. I know where Wavell is. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's a three hour drive. How fast y'all go? <laughs> right? You know. But I guess I guess you have to consider this in a sort of fictive exactly. geography as well. Exactly. Very very good. But this is this description that the author gives of his hometown. He's going back to his hometown for some reasons that we we'll, might get into a little bit later. But we have this description of that hometown. Yeah, the South is America's longest running crime scene. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. But the thing is, if you're born into a meat grinder, you grow up around the gears. So eventually you don't even see them anymore. You just see the beauty of the sausage. Maybe that's why, in spite of everything I know about it, I've always loved the South. Was born and raised in a small southern town called Bolton. Chances are you've never heard of it. And, that's, and if that's the case, don't you go worry about that or feeling bad. The fact is the matter there's no reason for anybody to have ever heard of Bolton, which is to say it's a hick town in the middle of a hick county in the lower leg of a hick state. So not knowing about it is probably a sign you're not a hick and that you've been raised a little bit better than myself. Well, not only do I know where Bolton is, uh, my Aunt Ruby Dale and Uncle Junior live there, right? So <laughs> as I was telling you at lunch, I've probably inadvertently driven past your house without realizing it was yours. Very possible. Uh, on, on many occasions. But this whole notion of this being th- this hick place. So here I am, a hick in a certain way. I know where this place is. Uh, you know, you or the author here is maybe himself a hick, right? Um, I don't know how you would think of yourself, but... I guess what I would ask you is, and this is the question authors hate asking, but I'm asking you anyway. And one thing I love about this book is how much this book is about authors hating to be interviewed about being authors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which I was, I'm like, oh man, I'm cringing even asking you things, but, but I got to, and I just love it. It's just so delicious how you do that. So what was it like growing up in the middle of a Hick County in the lower leg of a Hick State? Uh, personally, I loved it. I loved growing up in the town of Bolton. Um, I still live there. I have loved it my entire life. So it works very well for me. I'm a kind of guy where I like quiet. I like small town rural life and Bolton is exactly that. So it's been wonderful. Yeah. And this is the, and the author who again is not you, but also sounds like you sometimes mm-hmm. when he doesn't mm-hmm. here a couple pages later, um, he's talking with, uh, with his agent who is this completely ridiculous person in, a, in some interesting ways. But he says, uh, I had a pretty normal childhood. I grew up in a small town that nobody's heard of in the ass end of North Carolina. Well, now that I think about it, maybe you could count that as trauma. I don't think that's funny. Neither do I. Have you ever been to Bolton? No, you know I haven't. There's nothing there. It's just an empty hole decorated around the edges with people living in single wide trailers and clapboard homes like the nearest breeze will blow them over. I think you're exaggerating, she says. Everyone does. There is something beautiful but traumatic about this, as you said. I mean, this is the meat grinder mm-hmm. metaphor you give mm-hmm. earlier, right? You know, at some point you don't even notice the gears. You just mm-hmm. say the sausage is delicious. Mm-hmm. I guess this is getting to this then. What do us... Hicks who know where a place like Bolton is from. What do we have to say to the rest of America? How do we speak to the state of America in a unique way? Or am, in so doing, am I just being nostalgic and romantic about my own place, right? Um, do we have, do people that know where a place like Bolton is, people that are from a place like Bolton, have something to say to America about what America means, about what the South means, about what being a human being means? Are there truths that we have to tell that are maybe not accessible easily accessible to, to, to people that ain't Hicks. No, of course there are. I mean, yeah. people that come from small towns, people that come from these rural areas that no one's ever heard of that oftentimes grow up in extreme poverty because rural areas are oftentimes laden with poverty. Like, yes, you have something to say. And part of why I wrote hell of a book was to kind of highlight the fact that you can live on and grow up on a dirt road in a small county in a very poor county and still have something important to say about America, about just yourself, maybe, even if you're not talking about America. Um, I remember when I first decided I want, you know, I was 14 when I decided I wanted to be a writer. Um, But that wasn't an option for me. Like people from Bolton don't become writers. You either join the military, you go work at the local paper mill, or you go work at the DuPont plant. Like those are your main three options. But the idea that you could become a writer was not something that was viable. And yet I knew that I had things I wanted to say. And so, yeah, it's really rewarding. Like, yeah, people from small towns, rural areas, like, yes, you definitely have something to say. And I think it's important to kind of realize that a voice is real and you can totally become a writer or whatever else you want to be. I I love what you say there uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, it resonates with me for a whole variety of reasons. And a- again, I just love how the book, the book itself is also about itself, which would, I do love this sort of hyper-referentiality of it. And what you just said then leads me back to Sharon um, and, and Jack, the agents here in the book, who seem very, very earnest mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. but they, they really care about moving units. They really care about, you know, getting the book out there and doing sure. that. 
and the sort of reality, the thing that it's that the book itself is really sort of getting to, they seem so blind to. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. they just can't see this. And so you is here. Um, you know, Jack is talking to, to the author about the book, and he says, so here are the key points you need to make about Hell of a Book, which I find hilarious, you know, that someone's telling the author, here are the key points to your book. Sure. Here the th- here's what's important <laughs> in your book. I, I just love it. I, I'm not an artist. I'm not a writer myself, but I can just imagine how infuriating that, that might be. This is what's important in your book, sir. Right? <laughs> He leans forward on the table, ready to whisper the great secrets that I later found out my publisher was paying $350, $350 an hour for me to hear. Okay, I say, who are you? I don't think I understand. I know for a fact I don't understand. <laughs> who are you, Jack repeats. It's the only point you need to make about your book. It's the only thing anyone has ever really needs to make about anything. Who you are defines the world in which you exist. Now stop for a second because he says that so earnestly. But to me, the evidence of the book seems to be that who you are is shaped by externalities as well, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of vice versa. The external defines us and creates this thing that, you know, you're going to call, you know, on the next page, this, you know, labyrinth inside of me, right? Mm -hmm. Sharon and Jack here, they just seem so disassociated from reality, which is wonderfully ironic because if you've read the novel, you know that the narrator, the author, is himself often disassociated from reality, right? You know, <laughs> he sees things that might or not be there and like it begins every conversation with, are you really there or am, I, or am I seeing things? But he goes on and talks about this internal labyrinth inside of him. How does that labyrinth function? Is, uh, is someone like this Hick, this person we've been talking about here, someone like somebody from Bolton, is that individual, for all the disadvantages that are there in a place like Bolton, is that individual sometimes privileged because they face the tragic, the painful external realities of life that force them to face that they can't get outside of that internal labyrinth inside themselves and force them to wrestle with how that internal labyrinth itself actually functions, how it shapes them, and who they are within that labyrinth? Um, I don't think that they're necessarily privileged in that regard. I think that whether or not you choose to grapple with these things, I think it is just that it is a choice. I think mm-hmm. people oftentimes choose to ignore so much of that, that internal part of themselves because they're going to focus on the stimuli. They want to focus on the news, the movies, their phone, Twitter, Facebook, yeah. whatever distraction, it can be marriage. It can be the kids, whatever distraction in their life that they can re- create to avoid looking internally and really sitting with who they are and their thoughts and all these things that do exist inside of all of us, I think it's a choice. And so for this, for the book and for these characters, it's a discussion about what happens when you turn, you turn that lens inward for a very long extended period of time. And at the yeah. same time, you are combating with the external. I mean, life is a mixture of nature and nurture. You have the nature part of you, which is fully internal. But then you also have the world around you that you must interact with and that will interact with you whether you want it to or not. So finding that balance and trying to focus on both of those equally is very difficult, um, regardless of where you're from or where you grew up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any of that. That's really good. I really, man, no, I really like that a lot. I mean, because, I mean, I think we see this so often in so much of our great literature. It's really about trying to find that balance between the external and the internal and, and how you do that. And there's a weird way in which I kept reading this novel and it's going to sound bizarre, but I kept thinking about Ike McCaslin in Faulkner's Go Down Moses, right? I kept thinking about someone who is trying to sort of wrestle with these kind of forces there. And it's because he's looking for truth, but in some ways, it's not really that he's looking, he's looking for a truth, but he thinks he's looking for capital T truth. Sure, but sure. what he's actually, but it's very self-serving because mm-hmm. he just decides, he just wants to, these wonderfully Faulknerian verbs, right? He wants to repudiate and relinquish all these things he has received, you know, that the South has bequeathed to him. How this plays in with his own, um, just wants to cut himself off from everything. But he can't. He's deeply in the web of all these things, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, And one thing I loved about Hell of a Book is it kind of seemed to kind of, what you were just talking about, wrestle with the tension between the internal and the external. But the author here kind of recognizes that He's honest enough to realize, I am stuck in these, right? right? I am stuck in these. I am sort of caught in these. And there's so much here that is about him navigating that, which is about, you know, there's all this stuff where he keeps being asked to, he keeps saying he doesn't want to explain blackness. Right. But he feels like he has to. Mm Mm-hmm. Is that something the novel's trying to work through about this inheritance? And again, I hesitate to ask you any question about (laughs) the book says that, well, I don't want to answer these questions. Is there this sense where, this character or you as author or just the world of the book as the whole is trying to figure out 
what it is that we Southerners, what it is that black Southerners are trying to repudiate, relinquish, or maybe the book is intelligent enough to realize that we can never actually get rid of these things. We're always kind of stuck. Yeah, I think we, I think whether you want to be or not, you're oftentimes stuck with your 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 differentness. I'll say it that way. And what I mean by that is, regardless of you know who you are, if you are any kind of minority, whether it be you know black minority, uh, LGBTQ, be woman, whatever it is, female, like you, when you become an artist and you try to kind of enter into like the larger kind of conversation, you are always restricted to speaking about your minorityness. Yeah. Yeah. So if you are a black writer, you are the black writer yeah. forever and a day into your career, whether you want to be or not, you can, you can write Lord of the Rings and you're still the black Lord of the Rings or whatever it is. You're never allowed to just be who you are in that context. And so the book has this discussion about the impact of that and the push and pull of that and how someone tries to navigate and process that. And at the same time, they're trying to be an artist and yet they're also in this world where regardless of what art they create, they will always be judged by that minority component. Yeah. Um, the adjective is always going to be the yeah, primary thing. Exactly. That will mouth, yeah. always exist. And you have to learn to do that, to navigate that because kind of how I said earlier, like, the external world will always interact with you, whether you want it to or not. Yeah, you absolutely. cannot dictate how the external absolutely. world interacts with you. And that is one of those interactions that you have to learn to navigate. There's a word you use kind of in, in, in passing, um, kind of almost like a, you just kind of just throw out there early in the book. What you're saying here kind of leads me into, in, into wanting to talk about this word, which is myth. Because mm -hmm. here you have early in the book, you have uh, the character Soot and his father are going to visit the father's father, Daddy Henry. So they're going to visit him in a nursing home. And there is this uh, moment here where Soot, who's, who is the narrator at this point, says, Daddy Henry was a creature of magic. He was filled with stories of the way things used to be. People in places that used to exist in this world but that had long since faded away into little more than story and myth. How does, I mean, this is maybe the most pretentious question I've ever asked anyone. <laughs> what is myth? What is myth? <laughs> And, and I'm asking this because I actually have some reasons I want to get to this as we move forward in the book. Because, you know, when I talk to my students about myth, sometimes we can just say this is just a lie, something we, that's been made up. And that's always kind of present. But there's also this sense that myth is also these, like, stories we tell mm -hmm. to figure out how we belong and how we fit into something bigger than mm -hmm. ourselves. So how does myth work for you as an author, and again, I look at your other novels where you're playing so often with this style we might loosely call magical realism or mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. right? How does myth work for you in this book and in your art generally? What is the purpose of myth making for someone like Daddy Henry, for someone like, you know, the author here in the book itself? Well, I mean, myth, myth has always worked the way, you know, it still works the way it always has. And that myth is the stories that we tell in order to pass on social norms and social mores, sure, sure. all of the things that we as a culture or a society find important. Um, I'm a big fan. I grew up reading a lot of Joseph Campbell and study of the monomyth and yeah. just his eloquent and amazing studies into mythology. So anytime you mention the word myth, Joseph Campbell automatically comes to my brain and so within the novel, yeah, when the characters mention myth, because I was someone who grew up reading a lot of mythology and loving it, you have to remember that the sole purpose of mythology is to pass on cultural norms and social mores and to remember and reinforce the things that we value as a society or as a group of people, whether that be the majority in the sense of like the American myth or the minority in the sense that the Bolton mythology and my personal mythology and things of this manner. But that is what mythology has always done. And that's what the character of Daddy Henry does. And that's what the book does. The hell of a book tries to look at some of the mythologies of blackness, the mythologies of America, the mythologies of white America, like all these different mythologies that we kind of swim through every day. The book wants to kind of pause for a second and really study those for a moment and then, you know, have a few things to say about them. So is that what, you know, Daddy Henry a few pages later is going to look at, you know, Soot and say, you know, white people never did nothing to you, mm -hmm. right? Is that participating in this? Is that, is he myth making there or is, or is he trying to, what he thinks is a truth or? Yeah, know? I think it's for readers to figure out. Yeah, it's one of those yeah. questions to let readers figure out. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Very, very good. So, but he says, you know, white people didn't do nothing to you, but then a little bit later, white people will do something to him, mm -hmm. right? In that, you know, Soot's father. And if anyone knows anything about the book at all, they know that Soot's father is killed by a white cop, right? Mm -hmm. when he's out jogging. So you have that there. That moment produces all of these other sort of moments that, that spill out. That's going to sort of really shape the sort of plot of the whole book in many ways. And I don't mm -hmm. want to give too much away because I want people to go and buy the book. And But this connection between myth and truth this does kind of 
come to the fore when the author is sitting on the steps of a house and this white man creeps out from out in the darkness, out in the shadows, mm-hmm. and it's the man who had done the killing. Mm-hmm. Right? He says, I didn't shoot him. And then the author says, but it's the truth. And he says, but I won't say it. For some of us, we think if we don't tell the truth, if we mm-hmm. keep telling the myth, it still allows us to kind of exist in some sort of, I don't, I don't know what. And this white guy, he's sitting there begging the author to write down my, I come to you because I need somebody to write my story down. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, I love the fact that, you know, the author in speaking here is recording the story. Mm-hmm. And then you as author yourself, as sort of meta author, are actually are writing his story down, <laughs> right? right? Which I like. And this leads to this moment that is the part of the novel that was the most troubling and significant to me, most perplexing to me. Because when I hear this white guy here talking, I hear my people, right? Mm-hmm. I hear people that I know what this guy sounds like. I know what he sure. looks like. Sure. And I look in the mirror sometimes and he looks like me. Mm-hmm. He sounds like me. Mm-hmm. And that's something I really had to, I was really wrestling with and I was really trying to contend with as, as I was going that. Because I hear in his words the words of my own people, the voice of my own people, maybe sometimes my own voice. Then we get to this moment, this really kind of, profound interaction of, of, of truth and myth that go on here, where at the end of that chapter, you have this incredible moment. I'm not going to read because I want people to find it themselves. I, I, want, I want people to find the novel, pick up the novel, buy the novel, and read this. But you, there's a moment where the white guy's talking to the black writer, and then off in the distance, the writer sees these ghosts, these shades, these shadows of the past where mm-hmm. these, these slaves come out. Mm-hmm. And then the white man just goes and disappears literally into darkness, capital D, mm-hmm. with them out in the cornfields. And this is a moment that, you know, I read that moment. I sat there for a long time, just ponder over that. And it's a moment that I've, I've literally had dreams about that moment, Jason. Mm-hmm. I've literally had moment, dreams <laughs> about that moment. Is this some sort of vision of some sort of kind of racial detente? Is this a vision where black and white South, they get a, they get to have a shared mythology or is this just me as the white guy reading it in a way that I want to? <laughs> you see, you see? I yeah, mean, no, I totally see. Um, but no, that's, that's another a question I leave for the critics and for the readers to talk about and to decide, because there's a lot to unpack in that moment. And there's, you know, the phenomenon of being the author is if I give you a definite answer to any question, it automatically shuts down your imagination and your, 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 the digging that is so rewarding when you dig into moments like that. Um, If I give you a definite answer as to why I did this and the the intended goal of a moment like that, it takes away your fun of digging and your fun of imagining and you're debating with friends and readers. Um, So yeah, so I'm going to do that terrible thing where I actually don't answer that question. Um, But I will, I will just say that that was a very like from the from the moment that scene was written um my my sister who was one of the first people to read the book um she because she she understands like i've been through it's my fourth novel i've been through the editing process and things get oftentimes lost in the editing process and i remember my sister was being she rarely kind of draws a line in the sand but we were talking and i was about to sell the book trying to find a home for the book and my sister said no matter what happens do not let them remove that scene um, and for me, I was kind of on the fence about the scene. Um, I liked it, but at the same time, it was, you know, I wasn't, just wasn't confident about it for whatever reason. Um, but my sister was so adamant about how the importance of that scene and all the things that there were there to unpack in that moment and all the things that scene was doing. Um, so it's great to kind of see, you know, to have you kind of bring that up and talk about it because, yeah, it's a scene that I personally was kind of neutral about, but readers and other people who have come to the book um, just absolutely adore it. And there's so much there because um, I almost felt like there was too much there. And that's kind of why I was not sure about that moment. So it's great to hear people, you know, discussing it and unpacking it and pondering it and having dreams about it. Like, that's yeah. wonderful for me. Yeah, I uh, well, my immense thanks to your sister, because you know, like, <laughs> there's all those things I want to think about it. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then the novel keeps making me think, am I correct in that? And so I didn't. I don't want to be too hopeful, but I also want to be hopeful, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And I'm just. I just wrestled with that moment over and over again. It's just. I. I. I, I loved it. I loved it. Good. I, I adore. I adore that moment. Um. And I adore the whole novel. Um. I really, really do. It's just. It's funny. It's just charming. It's devastating and heartbreaking. And the thing. 
it's hilarious. That opening scene, man. Yeah, opening scene running through the hotel. <laughs> like, that's something, you know, like, not for the podcast, but at some point, you know, like, th- th- that seems a little too truthful, you know. <laughs> you know? Like, you actually know what you actually, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe that's not fully fiction. I want to end by just uh, uh, just a c- couple other things here. Uh, one, the dumb question I'm about to ask you. What's next for Jason Mott? What's next for uh, you as a writer? Um, hopefully another novel. I mean, I'm always working on some new book. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I pay my bills through writing, so I always have to be writing something else. So I am working on a new book. I have no idea when it'll be finished. I'm not even sure what it's about right now, yeah. but um, I'm just writing, which is all I ever want to do, so I'm happy. Fantastic, fantastic. And the last thing, the last thing. One thing in Hell of a Book is the author this is where the author is definitively not you is a little uneasy at first about going home, going Mm -hmm. back to Bolton and you've never left Bolton, Mm -hmm. you know, and you and I were talking at lunch about these feelings that I have about our mutual home County. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's really, really not much for me there. And I wonder sometimes having left, if, you know, I'm part of the problem. You see Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I left, and when I left, I took my knowledge, my skills, whatever I had with me. I guess I always wondered this. You as the person who never left home, Mm -hmm. but you write about people who are leaving home. Mm -hmm. People are coming back. Your first novel, Resurrection, is literally about people coming back, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of play where you're kind of reversing. There's the old trope in, you know, the Southern Church where, you know, you go to heaven and you've gone home, right? There's this reversal. You've come back home from home, right? Sure. It seems like you thought about these things. So was Thomas Wolf wrong? Can you go home again? <laughs> I think, no, you cannot go home again. Yeah. Um, but you can definitely still love your home as it is now. Yeah. And the thing about small towns is, and it's funny how people oftentimes have that, that small town guilt. Like they leave a small town yeah. or they, you know, they try, they move to a small town and find out they hate it and it's not for them. But the thing about it is like small town life is not for everyone. Like, yes, I stayed because it is for me. I Mm -hmm. like that type of quiet kind of sparse uh, lifestyle. That's just, I just like it period. Um, And I totally appreciate and understand when people it's not for them because I know it is not for everyone and that is totally okay. Um, So I think it's okay for people to just kind of realize that no, like, cause there is the ideal. There's this, this dream and image we have of like a small house in the country and you know, you got dogs and a big huge yard and cows or whatever running through it and you know, all that stuff. And I think that is, it's a cool fantasy, but it is primarily a fantasy. The reality is that small town life is very isolatory. Yeah. Um, you you know you you have to be built a certain way to really yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. And if you're not, that's fine. That's not yeah. a crime. That is you're not flawed in any way. Like if you like living in cities, New York, wherever, you're like you're totally okay. Um, so I always tell people like, yeah, small towns are great if you like them. And if you don't like yeah. them, that is also fine as well. And you can like them from afar. You can live in Atlanta and love Bolton from from from, yeah. from afar. I have cousins who do that. Yeah. I have cousins who live in Atlanta um, and they love coming home to visit, but they would never live there. And I feel the same way about Atlanta. I love visiting Atlanta for a weekend, but I would never live there. And that's okay. Yeah. I feel sometimes that uh, it was not for me when I was 18, mm-hmm. but now at, you know, 40, it is for me. Yeah, and that's it, how it, it happens it, too. It, like, and it just, it, it took me a long time. Oh, yeah. not, it just took me a while to realize that. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that's a, that's a real thing. But this goes back to what you were saying. There's the fantasy and there's the reality. Yes. Because y- y- you were talking a moment ago about, you know, the, the house out in the country on mm-hmm. the Fierica's land. You got your dogs and, mm-hmm. you know, your chickens mm-hmm. and everything running around. And I'm thinking, you're making me jealous. You know, like, this sounds beautiful. But then you immediately you said... But there's a fantasy of that. Yeah, too. And yeah, you're exactly right. And this gets to what we were talking about earlier: the way the the myth and the truth play into each yeah. other, the externalities and the internalities, yeah. the interweaving of those. I, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go home. I'm well, now I even caught myself there because what is home now? Right <laughs> there, you go. Is home the house I live with my wife and my children, or is home the house I grew up in? Yeah, well, the house my mama died in. Yeah, you can. Problem. They can be both. The answer can, be, can both, be both. Quite frankly, they can be both. They can be both. <laughs> Well, that's a wonderful thing, and man, I could just, I want to go home, and whatever that means, reread this book. So, Jason Mott, man, this is a wonderful conversation. Yeah, I love it. And, uh, y'all, there will be a video um, of this going up, too, up as we're getting our YouTube channel um, up and going, and this was just a wonderful conversation. And awesome. Jason, I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here, and this is Matt Simmons for the Institute for Southern Studies, saying until next time, y'all take it easy. That was our take on the South. Let us know yours. 
Find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at U of SC South. Take on the South is produced by Matt Simmons of the Institute for Southern Studies. Special thanks to Professor Dave Garner of the University of South Carolina School of Music for composing our music. Tune in next time for another Take on the South. Thank you.